All right, today we're going to talk about the significance or the political teaching and the significance of Locke and Hume all at the same time. And uh, I'm going to do that by first going through what I take to be the central components of Locke's thought and then the central components of Hume's thought. The, uh, the thing to, I think, recognize is that, that uh, what Arthur and, uh, and uh, Chris talked about that is that there is a there's a team. That is that the modern political thinkers uh, offer a coherent project. They build upon what one another does. Is true. Machiavelli is the originator. If you don't want to say it's Machiavelli, we can say Descartes the originator. If we don't want to say it's Descartes, we can say Bacon's the originator. If you don't want to say Bacon, we can say Hobbes. All of them say something like this: The people who came before me didn't know what they were talking about. Machiavelli was talking about Plato and Aristotle and Christ. Descartes was talking about Plato and Aristotle and Christ. Hobbes was talking about Plato and Aristotle and Christ. Hobbes says something like, political science did not exist until I wrote De Kive, that is, the citizen. And um, you know, Aristotle claimed to be a political scientist, but Hobbes says that wasn't political science. So, And Locke is on that team. That is, Locke is putting forward a theory, comprehensive theory, about how to reform reason, how to reform religion, how to reform our understanding of knowledge, and how to reform our ideas of politics in his corpus. He's going after everything. And Locke, as you can tell by reading the Second Treatise of Government, is also the, I would say, the first and most and deepest intellectual justification of modern liberal society as the United States of America understands it. Locke begins with the idea that individuals have rights. He derives from that idea that governments are made by consent. He derives the idea that governments are made by, or derives the idea of representative government from the idea that governments are made by consent. He justifies the idea of the right to revolution from the idea that governments are made by consent. And when they're not achieving their goals, you can end them. Just like marriage, when it's done achieving its goals of procreation and educating children, is done, and you can end it with a divorce. So when a government is not achieving its end, protecting property, liberty, and life, you can end it and build a new one. And from there, you can see Locke's teaching and the Declaration of Independence have direct mirrors to one another. And so, Locke is significant, most of all, for the purposes of anyone living in the modern world, for providing the intellectual justification for America. And that's, like, not nothing. Now, we should understand Locke's argument for this set of institutions, this set of political principles. And I think Locke makes two somewhat parallel arguments for what became American principles. Those two parallel arguments, we could, I could say, are first on Descartes' method, and second is an improvement on Machiavelli. We've seen a bit of the, De the Descartes method, but let's put this as, um, uh, with as much meat on it as we can. Locke clears the deck with the state of nature teaching. All established governments are shaken by this teaching and must now provide a justification for themselves. And that justification for themselves must be that they achieve the simples. That is, they achieve what, at the root of human nature, human beings are concerned with. And for Locke, I would submit, the first law of nature is preserve yourself. At the root of all other political goods for Locke is the desire for self-preservation.
And it's fun to do what I did last night, which is Google the word fence in lock. The word fence. Because fence for lock is a support for. And when you, you can follow the use of the word fence in Locke's second discourse to see the things that are supports for the desire that human beings have to preserve themselves. If you want to preserve yourself, what do you need? What are the fences to self-preservation? Paragraph 44. The right to life is a fence to self-preservation. Section 17. The right to liberty is a fence to self-preservation. If someone can exercise an absolute and arbitrary power over you, your preservation is at risk. So, the right to liberty gives you a right to protect yourself from anyone who would exercise absolute arbitrary power over you, that is, anyone who would enslave you. The condition of slavery is inconsistent with self-preservation. Paragraph 136. The rule of law is a fence to self-preservation. Human beings governed by standing rules, known beforehand, promulgated beforehand, allows you to know what, the, what is beyond the scope of the law, and hence uh, you can be punished for violating. What is political power? Political power is the power to make laws and enforce them with penalties up to death and all lesser penalties, paragraph three. Laws allow you to know what line you can't cross before you die. Laws are fences to our self-preservation. And then, there, of course, there's another side of that. Laws protect you. So a law against murder is one way that you can preserve yourself. So law is a fence to self-preservation. Of course, not just any law, paragraph 222, Locke says, laws made by representative governments are fences to our self-preservation. Laws, in other words, that respond to the legitimate desires that citizens have to preserve themselves, their property and their liberty, those other fences, are fences to self-preservation. And the last fence is perhaps the most interesting fence. For Locke, paragraph 226, the right to revolution is a fence to self-preservation. You can empower a government to make laws, to protect your property, to protect your life, and to protect your liberty. You can make those laws by consent, but the government still has to operate. And if that government what, loses its mandate, if that government forgets the reason for its own e existence, the people have the right to revolt against it and either get rid of that government or get rid of that society that has formed the government and to better preserve themselves. Now, it's hoped that the government, knowing that its citizens have the right to revolution, will not lose its mandate. So the right to revolution is there to teach government and to remind governments of their mandates and to inspire the people to be jealous of those other fences. So, as I say, Locke follows Descartes' method. He gives us principles for politics. Those principles are more sophisticated by the time you get to the right to revolution and representative government, but all of them are designed to secure 
the first basic desire and right of all human beings, that is, to preserve themselves. And think about this, being alive is a prerequisite for all other human goods. This is another way of saying the same thing. That is, you may like, you may like the beautiful, you may like the good, you may like the just, you may like coffee, you may dislike dry donuts that are twisted. You may dislike all of that, but in order to, be, to do any of those things, you must be alive. So, like Hobbes, at the root of all human goods is the idea that you're not yet dead. The desire to live. From that, you build rights to life, liberty, property, consent, representative government, right to revolution, more sophisticated ideas, compound ideas, as Descartes calls them in the third part of his um, method. But those compound ideas are all there to secure the simple. And in this, I think, Locke's idea of self-preservation at the root of his political theory resembles what Descartes says in part six of the discourse, that is, that the goal of science for Descartes will be the maintenance of health, which then Descartes goes on to say is the foundation and basis for all other human goods. To say that you are healthy is just a more sophisticated way of saying that you're alive and not wrapped with pain, I suppose. Or I should say you're healthy, you're alive, and the prospects are that you will continue to be alive for the foreseeable future. So you can take Locke's book, you can look at the table of contents, and you can see that it builds from simples to compounds. From simple ideas to more sophisticated fences, all designed to achieve and prosper that first simple idea. This means that government will be, well, I'll get to this in a little bit. Now Locke also praises this arrangement for what I would call its moral effects. And this is where I think Locke sees himself building on and improving upon Machiavelli. If he doesn't see himself as doing that, I'll just say it like this, he does it. Like Machiavelli in chapter nine of The Prince, Locke seems to think that Mankind are divided into two groups, two humors, as Machiavelli calls them. Machiavelli, Machiavelli says the two humors are those who want to oppress and those who want not to be oppressed. In Locke, in my idiom of Locke, I've talked about this in the past, Locke looks at it as the crazy and the lazy. Now, where do the crazy and the lazy come from? Why are human beings crazy and lazy? Let us drill down a little bit. Whence the crazy? I think for Locke, there are three origins of it. One, human nature. That is, some people are more ambitious, dangerous, turbulent and restless in their character. And those people are flattered to try to realize their ambition by ancient political thought and by Christianity, the second and third culprits of the late of the crazy. Ancient political thought teaches that human beings are unequal. And hence, perhaps some are born, booted and spurred, ready to ride their fellow man legitimately by the grace of God. C 
Christianity seems to teach a species of inequality. I'm qualifying that, but seems to teach a species of inequality, especially, I'll say, traditional Christianity. Some people have access to a hierarchy, participate in the hierarchy of the church, and then there are the followers, the flock, the sheep, who need a shepherd. That's an unequal relationship. So, turbulent spirits, restless, busy minds, exploit the, the prominence of ancient thought and Christianity and use those as vehicles to realize their own ambitions. Witness the divine right of kings. That's the crazy. Whence the lazy. The lazy have multiple sources as well. Once again, this is the way a lot of people are by nature. Locke refers, um, and I, I called attention to this passage last time, I think in, in paragraph 94, to the negligent and unforeseeing ways of the first ages. That is, the people in the, in the infancy of humanity were used to being governed by their fathers, or by father figures, or by priests. They were negligent and unforeseeing. They did not see the long-term consequences of such actions. Later on, when Locke announces that there is such a thing as the right to revolution, he raises an objection. I guess for those of you who want to turn to this, let's turn to paragraph 223 for just a moment. Locke raised an objection, one that Hume will later raise against Locke about the right to revolution. And the, the objection goes like this. If you announce the right to revolution, aren't you going to encourage people to revolt? <clears throat> and if you encourage people to revolt, aren't you going to upset perfectly well-functioning governments? Isn't the doctrine of the right to revolution dangerous for politics? Locke announces that objection, and then he responds in paragraph 223. Quite the contrary, he says. Y'all there? People are not so easily got out of their old forms as some are apt to suggest. They are hardly to be prevailed with to amend the acknowledged faults in the frame they have been accustomed to. And if there be any original defects or adventitious ones introduced by times or by corruption, Tis not an easy thing to get them changed, even when all the world sees there is an opportunity for it. This slowness and aversion in the people to quit their old constitutions has, in many revolutions which have been seen in this kingdom and in its former ages, still kept us, and, or after some intervals of fruitless attempts, still brought us back to our old legislative kings, lords, and commons. Locke is saying, the problem is we wait too long. We are averse to change. We won't quit our old constitutions. The right to revolution will not upset governments over much because people are naturally conservative, governed by habits. Unwilling to think that fundamental change is really necessary. Unwilling to dig to the depths of the corruption and to root it out. Human beings are naturally lazy. So we have the turbulent and the lazy. 
And if we remember right, what Machiavelli does with these two humors is say, well, as a prince, you're better off aligning yourself with those who want not to be oppressed. Their aims are decent. They're not going to ultimately threaten the basis of your rule. And in fact, you should kind of celebrate them. So after you've established yourself and, and laid firm foundations in the rule of law or the next excellent president and civil courts, and maybe you've cut some people in half and put them in the piazza, but whatever. Once you've done that, show up at parades. Give medals for people who invent things. That way, the common folks will think you're really aligned with their desires and their hopes. So Machiavelli takes sides. And I think that's wise. That's why we say that Machiavelli is the first democratic thinker. He aligns the goals of political philosophy with the goals of the people, as opposed to the aristocrats. While he doesn't say that all men are created equal, I think he'd be happy. Locke, on the other hand, does say all men are created equal. And Locke wants to, I would say, use these doctrines. All men are created equal, all men have rights, all men have the right to property, to defang the aristocrats and Fill the people with pride. Locke wants to intervene in this factional conflict that Machiavelli notices and not and take sides. I'm not denying that. He takes the sides of the industrious and rational over the quarrelsome and the contentious, as he puts it in paragraph 34. He takes sides, but each side changes because of the way he intervenes in politics. His political teaching is supposed to have an effect on each side. How will it affect the lazy? The lazy must now gain their fruit of, uh, of gain what it takes to live, eat, through work. Human beings will work, they will labor. They will gain property as a result of their labor. And their property is a fence to their self-preservation. They will invest pride in their labor and property. And they will feel it's bad when someone takes their property away. The people will be more jealous of their liberties. They will anticipate ways in which their liberties could be trampled upon by a government, recognizing that they have a right to revolution behind them if the government goes too far. Locke takes the side of the lazy, but he transforms them into something less lazy. They become, as I say, industrious, that is, hardworking, and rational, seeing threats from the long term and trying to meet them. In other words, Locke tries to give the people a pride. Only if they have that pride will they not be oppressed. They won't be protected by a wise and godlike prince so much as they will protect themselves from the encroachments of princes or representative government or whatever comes their way. How does Locke change the crazy? I would submit that Locke changes the crazy in this way. You're just like everyone else. You desire self-preservation. You have to work for your land. Heritable land is not long for this world in a, in a world where people have to work and labor for most of their property. You too, eventually, aristocrats, will have to own a mine or plow your fields or hire out labor or enter manufacturing if you want to keep your high spot in society. 
In other words, you put your pants on one leg at a time, you have to work two. Locke changes the basis for the arist aristocracy from birth to work. And this is something that we, products of Locke, probably don't recognize how kind of interesting and revolutionary that is. When you look at the history of the world, most people look down at work. Locke tries to make work pay, both with money and honor. Some of you guys have read uh, Solzhenitsyn with me, Stoyipin a Lockean reformer, making sure that the peasants of Russia have land that they can work of their own, that they can take the products from their land and take it to market with an advanced transportation system. They can learn how to till their land with an education, a technical education that teaches them how to exploit the soil and preserve it at the same time. And who was upset by Stoyipin? The aristocrats of Russia have him assassinated. Pretty smart. Long-term vision, Stoyipin points to the elimination of feudalism. Locke, by making the basis of property labor, is aiming at the heart of feudalism. So I think Locke intends a moral revolution using the scientific theory of Descartes as his tool. And just one more thing, maybe this is the third topic. Locke aims not to, oh, how to put this, not to eliminate the church, which Machiavelli seems to think is necessary. Locke aims not to show through science that the hypothesis of God is irrelevant, as Descartes tries to do. Locke is much more insidious than that. Locke tries to change Christianity from the inside. He does this in several different ways, not all of which are in the Second Treatise of Government, but as I'm laying things out, let me start with those that are in the Second Treatise of Government and then move to the others. Just two examples here. One, Locke's teaching on money. Now what does Locke say in the second treatise about money? Well, he says money is co-evil. The invention of money is co-evil with civil society, which I mean they happen at the same time. What is money? It's common agreement of people to assign worth to an otherwise worthless piece of rock. That common agreement to say that that rock is worth something is a lot like the common agreement we make to form a civil society. It's common agreement. I mean, there isn't anything in nature or under heaven that makes gold worth more than a banana. It's human agreement. Now, granted, bananas rot, but you, so that would be one thing. It's good to have something that doesn't rot. I'll, put, I'll use a different example. Plastic or gold. Neither rot, but like we don't care about plastic, we just throw it out. But no one would throw out gold. OK, so money comes about um, by common agreement. Any event, we don't need to get bogged down on that. What does the Bible say of money? 
Well, Locke quotes it, and he says that money, the love of money, is the root of all evil. What does it benefit or prosper a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul? But let's stick with the love of money is the root of all evil. And there's a reason that the love of money is the root of all evil. It's a distraction from the important things of life, the eternal destiny of your soul. So, Christianity has a tension-filled relationship with the love of money. Locke appears to say, well, that's a pretty good idea. But then when you dig deeply into his second treatise, you realize that the love of money is the root of all progress, according to Locke. The argument goes something like this. Without money, people labor only for today. Money introduces a love of money which encourages people to work beyond today because they can store up the value of their labor in money. Human beings come to try to acquire larger estates, larger piles of apples, larger piles of walnuts, and then they sell those walnuts or apples to their fellow man, and then they get the piece of gold and the glittering piece of gold can be used in other contexts to buy other things. Money is stored labor. Stored labor encourages labor. Encouraging labor encourages property. And encouraging property and, it's, um, and uh, the increase of the, the amount of property that people pursue creates prosperity. What could be wrong with prosperity? And in fact, doesn't prosperity act as a kind of charity? We can use our prosperity to make sure we live longer lives. See, it's your Christian duty to love money. You're much better off making that argument than you are saying, assassinate the Pope. Because within three, four, five generations, people will love money. They will love progress and material things. They will love property. And they'll forget about their soul. A different iteration of the same kind of internal attack on Christianity can be seen in Locke's letter concerning toleration, which we haven't read for this class. So, as a used car salesman once said, trust me. Locke says in, oh, let, me, let me back up for a second. Christianity is not in its nature pro-toleration. What I mean by that is, there's a good argument for persecution. A good Christian argument for persecution. The good Christian argument for persecution goes like this. You've probably never heard it. It really matters what you believe. And people will spread wrong ideas. And those wrong ideas will have an effect on what people think and believe. In order to care and love those people who might be vulnerable to wrong beliefs, it is best to identify those with wrong beliefs, find them, root them out through different means according to the circumstances. Jail's not bad, but you know, hot coals may be necessary to do the job. It's not for the persecutor that you persecute. 
It's for the innocent third party that you persecute out of love for your fellow man and concern for his soul, you persecute. St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, you can find it. And, of course, people who argued against John Locke made the same argument. In response to this, Locke says the following, like third paragraph of the uh, letter concerning toleration. Toleration, Locke says, is the chief characteristical mark of the true church, end quote. True churches tolerate. In fact, their central premise, most important characteristic, is that they are tolerant. Why are they tolerant? Because they respect the right to liberty, or as we might say, the right to conscience. Why is the right to conscience so important? Well, the only, um, the only belief worth having is a belief freely entered into by the person who must be able to survey all that is out there and figure out what's best. And besides, where has persecution gotten us? It has left us poor with unrepresentative governments that we don't revolt against and that we trust the leaders because they're appointed by God. The new religion will not be a persecuting religion. The new religion will be one that respects the individual. And as I say, you don't hear the argument for persecution very much today. Can we agree? Why is that? The success of Locke. Vatican II is John Locke applied to Catholicism. Would you agree? There's a lot there. <laughs> there is a lot there. But I'm speaking broadly. Because it might be Kant. Anyways. So all of this is to say is that Locke embraces modern political thought as Descartes understands it in order to rid the world of uncertainty. He produces principles for politics that should guide political practice regardless of time and place if you want to establish governments that will preserve people in their lives. And that there must be a religion to match that government. Christianity must be tamed and brought under the auspices of the Cartesian principles that Locke has articulated. So Locke, I mean, you can go through all of his books. Locke reforms philosophy in his essay concerning human understanding and in his book On the Conduct of Human Understanding. That's his Descartes books. Locke reforms politics in the second, first and second treatise of government. Those are his political science books. Locke reforms religion in his The Reasonableness of Christianity and his first, second, third, and fourth letters concerning toleration. He goes after everything. He's reforming the world. Now, a generation later comes a Scotsman, a dandy, as you can see from the, pay, uh, from the portrait of his inset. Very nice. And uh, also looking very nice in, his, uh, in, the, in, the, in the poster that is just all around campus that has brought all of this huge crowd in today for a uh, discussion of John Locke and David Hume. Now, Hume is best thought of as a critic of Locke. As I think uh, you guys would have seen in the, um, uh, I can't do that, uh, as you probably have, would have seen in the article that I assigned today, the chapter from a book, um, David Hume writes uh, a book of essays that you guys have assigned for you or are to have bought, and you know, two-thirds of the essays in the book 
are aimed at John Locke and his philosophy. Um, and that's a somewhat, you know, stringent definition of those things. You could probably make an argument that there are more. But John Locke's theory came to be institutionalized in a party in England. And that party in England is known as the Whigs. The Whigs, W-H-I-G, stood for the anti-monarchical principle in England. The Whigs were responsible in a few years after John Locke wrote the Second Treatise of Government for the Glorious Revolution, which was switching one family and its kings, the Stuarts, for another, bringing in William and Mary to be the king and queen of England from Holland, right? But of course, that's just switching one monarch for another. Over the course of time, the Whigs came to be known for eroding the power of the monarchy and trying to increase the power of the parliament in England. It's one thing to change monarchs. It's another thing, I think we can all agree, to get rid of monarchs. And the Whigs, in their theories, appealed to Locke. They appealed to Locke, the need for representative government, the need for consensual government, an embrace of the right to revolution and things short of revolution like protest. So the Whigs over the course of time came to be the ascendant power in England. The Whigs were responsible, if we can go to Hume's time, for things like the Seven Years' War, the British building an empire, the British attempting to export constitutional government to other countries. That's where Hume gets the turban. And arrayed against the Whigs were the Tories. Tories. And the Tories also had a theory of politics. Their theory of politics was the divine right of kings. Now, I would say that in Hume's day, the Whig party was the beautiful people party. By which I mean, if you, were, if you wanted to be part of the direction that history seemed to be going, you embraced the Whigs and their theories. The divine right of kings and the Tories were so 1920s. And Hume sees himself as a species of dissident in the context of England, and I think in the context of modern political thought generally. Hume thought commerce was great. Hume thought representative government was a great innovation. Hume thought the separation of powers was a really good idea. And Hume thought the defanging of religion was fantastic. Let's go further. But the whole idea that you can justify those innovations in the terms of modern political science, Hume thought was wrong. So he liked the goals, but he dissented from the scientific self-understanding of moderns. And you see this on the surface of things in the political writings that I have assigned uh, over the last three weeks. Hume thought the original contract was not a great way to build a political theory. It was contradicted the experience of man and upset existing perfectly well-functioning governments, reflected a lack of understanding of what, it, what leads to a good government. Hume thought the teaching of the divine right of kings of passive obedience, or 
active resistance from the Whigs and passive obedience from the uh, Tories were both madness. You don't have to tell people that to revolt, Hume says, they'll do it if it's bad. And you don't have to teach people to submit. They'll do it unless it's bad. Both the theories upset, misshape political practice. I did not assign this essay, but the third essay in the essays is hilarious if you're like a total geek. <laughs> and uh, and the, the title of the third essay in the essays is That Political Science Can Be Reduced to a Science or that politics can be reduced to a science, excuse me. And in it, I mean, you're like, oh, good, here, finally, we're gonna find out what is scientific about the study of politics. And Hume's answer is something like this. Yeah, all things being equal, it's best if you spread out power instead of concentrate it. But, you know, sometimes the other thing, too. And all things being equal, it's better to have separation of powers of the executive and the lawmaking, but you know, circumstances sometimes dictate the opposite. Thanks, David. Like, I couldn't write that politics may be reduced to a science and get a PhD today, although I kind of did. So, there are no, I should uh, back up a little more. Hume really complains, and this was the uh, burden of the piece that was assigned uh, for today. Hume really complains about the presence of abstract principles in politics. He says, man, it's a real sign of corruption when no party can exist without justifying every plank in its platform by some abstract speculative principle. People try to then to reinvent the world in light of their theories. And reinventing the world in light of theories is, ends up undermining the world to vindicate a theory. While it's unfair to say this, just ask Stalin. Like, collective farm's a great idea whose time has come, Ukraine, regardless of what you say. Now, England was not under the influence of Stalin, but it was under the influence of the Whigs. And in Hume's view, the Whigs were undercutting what made the British Constitution work. So, step back for a second. I say that Hume or Locke wrote the scientific books, the political books, the religious books. That's all true. Hume wrote books on epistemology, that is, books on philosophy, the inquiry concerning human understanding, the treatise on human nature. Those are the things for which he is most known. Hume wrote books on politics. He wrote these essays. And he wrote a six volume history of England to try to explain how England became England, the greatest country in the world. By the time he died, 1776, like, oops, good year. Uh, it's hard to, in a way, deny what Hume is saying. Like, it's the place most prosperous, most self-controlled, uh, most public-spirited, most individual liberty. He calls it the happiest constitution in human history. And, you know, I'm open to that. He wrote books on politics, as I say, the essays and the history being the, the chief ones. And then Hume wrote books on religion, dialogues concerning natural religion, discourse on miracles and other things. He also sought to reform Christianity. Um, maybe, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that. But the middle part was where we're gonna focus, Hume's teaching on politics, okay? Hume thought the British Constitution worked, but not because of Whig theory, okay? But the Whigs were trying to make the British Constitution to reflect, to remake the British Constitution 
to reflect wake theory. Therefore, they were undermining it. You can see this in several things in Hume, and once again, these are things that were discussed in that uh, book chapter for today. I'm just going to focus on one. The right to representative government. Locke called the right to representative government a fence to good government. It protects the rule of law and ensures that the laws reflect the people's desire to preserve themselves. So that over the course of time, representative government was going to work best. Now Hume's answer to this may seem a little offensive to our democratic sensibilities, but let's just consider it for a moment. Representative government? Are you kidding me? Have you seen these people? That's my rendering of it. But there's a lot more to it than that. Why does the British Constitution work? Well, the British Constitution does do things that Locke thinks it should. The British Constitution does have an executive. We call him the king. The British Constitution does have a legislative branch. We call that the parliament. More particularly, we call it the House of Commons. The House of Commons is not really all that separate from the king. The king appoints a lot of members to the House of Commons. Only about 10,000 people in Great Britain vote for the House of Commons. It's hard to say that's a representative government. There are a lot of rotten bureaus. You guys ever heard of this? There are a lot of districts in Great Britain where no one votes and the king appoints that member of parliament. Without the king appointing members of parliament, Hume says, parliament would become a purely democratic body, reflecting only the desires of the many in Great Britain. And the many can be just as tyrannical as the few. 